Gonna be going to Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four, verse number eighteen. If you recall from our previous studies, we've been looking at Abraham and how he was our example in faith. Today, Lord Moon will kind of close up our study of Abraham. But verse number 18 through 21 says, Who, referring back to Abraham, says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Amen. Paul has been showing us the faith of Abraham, how it was counted for righteousness, how it is the same for us today, that we believe in God and it is counted to us for righteousness. In verse 18, though, he says, Who against hope believed in hope? Mm-hmm. As said Abraham, he, contrary to hope, contrary to the all visible and rational grounds of hope, as Brother Gill writes, it says, To the flesh, there looked like there was no hope at all. Right. As we'll get to in a moment, but Abraham and Sarah were far past the normal age of having children by this point. Yeah. And medically, it looked like there would be no chance of them having children. Right. But yet, the promise of God was that he would be a father of many nations. It says against hope, or it says against really all grounds of hope as far as the flesh looks at it, as far as man's perspective, it looked like there was no reasoning for hope. Yet he says he believed in hope. Mm-hmm. His faith in the promise of God gave him great hope. And really, we have the same. You could say ability today to have a great hope in the promises of God, even when things look bleak, even when things look physically impossible. And what is faith? We're going to start there for just a moment. But I know this is not my ordinary, but Larry, what does Hebrews 11 1 say that faith is? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You know, the substance of things hoped for is the first part of the definition. It's the our faith is our foundation of our hope. It's what holds up and supports our hope. Without faith, we cannot have hope. So yeah. that, um, there's hope as the world hopes. You know, they hope that they'll have a good day. They'll hope that they'll win the lottery. They hope that <laughs> good fortune will come their way or things will get better in the economy. Or They hope that you know, if you're conservative, that the Republicans win the presidency year. Something like that, but that is not real hope. Not when we're talking about biblical hope. Right. So hope has something to rest upon. That's our, first and foremost, our faith in God. Amen. But also on, our hope can rest on the fact that God is God. That he does not give empty promises. And that is really where Abraham's Hope lies, as we'll see here in the next few verses, that he was fully persuaded, as it says, that God was able to to keep his promise. Amen. So what is hope is our my next question. It's, it's our expectation, it's the thing that we look forward to. Well, our great hope is the return of Christ, isn't it? Amen. Turn over to Titus for just a, a moment. I think Titus summarizes the two biggest things we have hope for as children of God. Titus 2, 
In verse 13, he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. That is our great hope, as he called it here, the blessed hope for the children of God. That our Lord Jesus Christ is going to return again. His glorious appearing, as it's called here, when he shall call us home, we shall be ever with the Lord, as First Thessalonians says. We have great hope in that, and we have our faith is really what say holds that up, if you will, but gives us grounds that we can be sure that that hope will come to fruition one day. Amen. There's many of that just hope that when they get before God, you know, they're good. He's going to say, oh yeah, your works were good enough. That's not real hope, is it? Right. That our, our hope is based upon the promises of God. His promises are yea and amen. Amen. We go back to the door of Titus 3, verse 7. Here he says, after he's describing being, or describing salvation, as he tells us, is not by works of righteousness, verse 5, but it's simply by his grace that we're saved. Verse 7 says that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. Yes, eternal life is a promise of God. As chapter 1, verse 2 of Titus says that, in hope of eternal life with God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God promised eternal life through the person of Christ before the world began. He says, mm -hmm. in fact, Revelation describes him as a lamb, lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And God already took care of it before time even existed. Mm -hmm. that's, some, that's hard sometimes for the carnal mind to comprehend that but God will not work within the constraints of time like we do. But these promises, these promises of eternal life, the promise of His return, these are all something we can have great hope in because Amen. our faith is fully rested upon God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not upon ourselves and something we have to do or earn, but that God has promised it, that God has provided the means for it, that God has really done done it all so we just simply must trust in him so that is the difference between our hope and the hope that the world offers is that we've had we have something sure to rest our hope upon or as i believe it's in hebrews it says that we have a hope that is steadfast and sure mm -hmm. but going back to abraham back in our text the promise that was specifically being spoken of here was that he might become the father of many nations. Remember, this was a promise given to Abraham back in Genesis. Amen. That he would, though yet he was still childless at the age of 75, yet he would become the father of many nations. Mm -hmm. And yet it says Abraham had great hope and faith in this promise. So much so that it was counted for him for righteousness. Oh, Brother Junior, if a couple years ago God told you you're going to have a child, you would have probably thought, well, that's not physically possible. Mm -hmm. Much less 25 years later after that promise. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet, it says that Abraham, he had great faith in this promise. Nothing else we can get from this example of Abraham is that we should have great faith in the promises of God. Amen. It says here that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, which is in Genesis 15, 5, so shall thy seed be. That verse was when God brought him out and said, look under the heavens and see the wolf to the stars. Yeah. Said, so shall I seem to be that really innumerable. I've, I've looked it up before, man has estimated the number of stars, and it's in the billions, I think. Wow. 
Just as in new rule as the stars, where he said, so shall I see and be. Amen. But looking from a man's perspective, from a fleshly aspect, man would have said, well, there's no hope in that. Right. Abraham, you're old and you don't have any children. Your, your wife is old. That's physically impossible. Yet we know that God is able to do that which is physically impossible. Amen. God is not bound by the laws of physics. He's not bound by the things that we are constrained by. Certainly, as we saw, God cannot lie. God cannot sin. He cannot do that which is contrary to his nature. But when he promises something, you can be sure it will come to pass. Amen. So if Abraham and Sarah were long past the normal age of having children, they were long past what man would consider even physically able to raise up a child. Mm -hmm. And yet God said, I'm going to make your seed as the, the sand of the sea, as the dust of the earth, as the stars in the sky. Amen. Well, if God was able to do that for Abraham, I'm quite certain he is able to do great things for us as well. Amen. All right. I didn't write this in my notes, but over in one place, Joshua said that we should stop and consider how great things God has done. Mm -hmm. Amen. And certainly he is able probably to do much greater than we even give him credit for. As Paul said in, to his letter, if he was to the Ephesians, that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen. Well, there is a nurse. I think if he can answer to this even better than I can, but if well, Brother Junior and Diane went to the doctor today and said, well, I think we want to have a child. The doctor would probably laugh at them. He would certainly say there, there's no hope for that. Right. Physically, medically, biologically. And so it was with Abraham, and yet even more so with Abraham, I'm sure they they didn't have fertility doctors and medication to even help right. those things out. Yet it says that he staggered not at the promise of God. Amen. It says going on in our text here. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, as according to that which was spoken, so shall I see be, verse number 19. And being not weak in the faith, and I think here's where a lot of us fall short, we're weak in faith, huh? Mm -hmm. that weak means to be feeble, be without strength, or be powerless. When we're weak in faith, we doubt the promises of God, we doubt his ability. And a doubting faith doesn't do us any good, does it? Uh, and God is able to do whatsoever He will, Amen. Despite our doubtings, but yet it does us a whole lot of good if we would actually just trust in Him fully, Amen. I know in the flesh we often doubt, in the flesh we think, well, how is this going to be? How is this possible? Think of Mary and Martha when Lazarus died. They didn't say, well, Lord, Jesus is here. He's going to raise him from the dead today. Martha said, Lord, if you'd been here, you could have healed him. Right. That's about the level of our faith. God, if you had done it my way, it would have worked out. But it says that Abraham here, he was not weak in faith. So let us follow up this same example of Abraham. Let us not be weak in faith. Amen. It's a weak faith of faith. A faith that's too feeble and powerless won't actually do anything for us. So it'll cause us to doubt, it'll cause us to, to trust in the flesh or in man, it'll cause us to look to the world rather than look to God. <coughs> he says, And being not weak in the faith, the weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. If you're familiar with the timeline of Abraham's life, it was, he was 75 when he headed out for Canaan land. And by this time that Paul is speaking of, he was 99, fixed to be 100 years old when Isaac would be born. Right. So 25 years had passed. 
Yet he, God still not fulfilled that promise. And I think that's, that's sometimes where we would falter as well, wouldn't it? Well, God, it's been so long. Yeah. Are you not going to be faithful to your promise? So say God doesn't work on our timetable, does he? That's right. So he says he considered not his own body now dead. No, I don't think I have ever on a biology lesson here, but you know, men, we don't go through the chain like women do, but yet man's body declines over the years, doesn't it? Right. By the time he's 99 years old, there's not a whole lot of chance of good reproduction happening. Right. So yet, in that sense, his body was dead. He wasn't expecting to have any more children. God showed him that he was able to do whatsoever he will, though, didn't he? He had Isaac and then more children through Keturah, right? So if a man has a, a young wife, at least, his chances go up quite a bit if he's old, right? With having children. I'll give you one example from our modern times. I think we all know who Mick Jagger is. 2016, he got his eighth child, 76 years old. But his girlfriend at the time was only 29. So. But yet, he didn't have, Abraham didn't have that going for him, did he? Right. Sarah was not exactly young herself either. He right. was at this point, nine, going on 90 years old, well past the uh, normal age for childbearing. As it says in the next part of our verse here, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was well past menopause, which today happens around the age on average, age 51. But well, no matter what age it happened then, she was well past that, right, 90 years old. And man will look at that situation and say, well, there's no hope of a child. There's no hope of you being the father of many nations. Right. But even if they somehow miraculously could conceive, man will think, well, there's no way Sarah could carry a child to term. But, and then raise a child at that age. We're both junior and sister Diane, how would y'all like to have a child now or is there you know, another 15, 20 years from now? Yeah. Man looks at that as a hopeless situation and yet God is able to do, how would I say it? He's able to do when what he wants, even when the situation looks hopeless. Amen. That's right. Yes. He is able to perform that which he has promised, even when there's great physical barriers and obstacles. Well, I don't know what the world's going to look like when Christ returns, but I know if you ask the average person today, they're going to say that's foolishness. Right. Well, there's no such thing as. Christ, there's no such thing as a return. It's not going to beam you up one day. That's how the world looks at it. They would, most would go as far as say, well, there's no such thing as even a God. Right. Yet though things may look hopeless around us in the world, God is still very much in control. He's still very much able You're to, right. to do that which he has promised. When despite all these barriers here, despite all these obstacles a man would say are impossible to cross it. It says of Abraham, he considered not these things. That is, that is he didn't fix his mind upon them. And I think that's where we often mess up too, isn't it? We might say, well, yeah, God, we're able to do this, but this is in the way. There you go. That's, that's kind of like what Peter did in Matthew 14, 30. He, he went and walked on the water to Jesus, but then he saw the wind boisterous and he doubted. We're a lot like Peter, aren't we? God, I know you're able to do great things. Oh, but no, there's trouble over here. No, there's this that's going to cause problems. And then we doubt the sufficiency of God, don't we? Right. And that is where the the key lies that faith, 
the light is completely upon God. Mm -hmm. When we rely upon ourselves or our fellow man, or we rely upon things of this world, they're bound to fail us. Right. Yeah, God cannot fail. Verse 20, going on, he says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. As he didn't stumble or waver at the promise. He, he was firm in his faith in the promise of God. Yeah, it's very easy in the flesh to doubt sometimes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder if Abraham ever doubted. Well, I think of the, example, the situation with Hagar, for example. I don't know, maybe he really thought that, that was going to be the fulfillment of the promise. I don't know. But certainly, from the outside looking in, it looks like he was not fully trusting in the promise of God at that point. Right. Yeah, it says he didn't stumble or stagger or waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. That is, he was, his faith was strong in the promises of God. His faith was completely relied upon God because, as we mentioned, there was no, no physical ability at that point to have any children. Right. Well, if you were, if you follow the promise there, at first he just says that he's going to be the father of many nations, and then, and so shall I see me as in the multitude of the stars of heaven and the dust of the earth. And, but eventually he says, well, no, the promise he's going to come through Sarah. And that took, I think, even greater faith because he said Sarah was well past having children. Yeah, it says he had great faith in the promise of God. He was, he was strong in faith. Would it be said of us that we are strong in faith or will we weak in faith? Right. Will we stand firm in the promises of God or will we waver when hard times come? Right. Well, that's the difference in the those in the parable of the sower. Some were sown on the, the good soil and they sprung up and had a root and they were brought forth much fruit. You know, there was others that were sown on stony ground and they blew away as soon as hard times came. Right. There was others that were sown among the thorns and they were choked out by the, the things of this world. I'm afraid many professing Christians today would be very weak in faith when it comes to really trusting in the promises of God. Yeah. So we have it pretty easy here. And, American society, but there are places in the world where Christians are persecuted just for naming the name of Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to have, you have to be strong in the faith to stand in the face of persecution. You know? Right. The average American Christian today doesn't have that strong enough faith, I don't think, to face real persecution or even death for the cause of Christ. Right. Well, we can be strong in the faith. We can have full assurance of the promises of God. But too often we follow the flesh rather than the spirit. Well, he says he was strong in the faith, giving glory to God. Amen. We must be give glory to God. Really, faith requires it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Faith relies fully upon God. It's not look at me and look what I have done or look what I am doing but it's look at God what he has done for me and through me the real biblical faith gives all the glory back to God because we have to say well there was nothing I could do just like in Abraham's situation here there was nothing he could do even if he had the best Fertility doctors in the world. I don't think there was any hope that he was going to have a child. Right. No, he fully had to rely upon God in this situation. You know, that's the problem with more Armenian type theology is that it's about what you did. Right. I did this, I prayed through, or I made the right decision, or I. No, we ought to say, no, God. It is for me. God saved me. God Amen. pricked my heart and convicted me and 
show me my need for a Savior. That's what I remember in my salvation. And I didn't raise my hand or repeat a prayer or anything like that. I remember just simply begging him, crying out to him, Jesus saved me. I, amen. I didn't think I was worthy to be saved, honestly. But so it is with other instances in our lives that faith requires us to fully rely upon God and His ability, not upon anything in ourselves. Therefore, we must give Him all the glory. Amen. Let's go on to verse 21 and we'll bring this to a close. And it says, And being fully persuaded, here's another key, that we can't be partially or almost persuaded. We have to be fully persuaded or fully convinced, if you will, of the promises of God. That God is able. We can't be like Agrippa in Acts 26, 28. You remember Paul preach, was preaching to him there and he said, almost persuaded thou me to be a Christian. Amen. One person said it, well, I think almost persuaded is fully lost. That's it. And to almost be persuaded of any of the promises of God is to doubt his sufficiency. We must be fully persuaded, as it says here in the next part of the verse, that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Mm -hmm. Abraham knew that God was able and that he would keep his promises despite anything that stood in the way. We must have that same type of faith in God that he will keep his promises no matter how hopeless and helpless the situation may look. You, know, you might be the most wicked of sinners and yet God is able to save you. Mm -hmm. It may look like the devil is in full control of this world, but God is going to show us one day that he's going to return. He's going to rain down his vengeance upon this world. Right. Those are just two of the bigger examples. But every promise he has made in his word, he will be faithful to it. But in another place he says that they, he's going to, his people are going to be persecuted, but he said, yeah, out uh, here your head shall perish. That's it. God will fully protect his people. That doesn't mean we might not face physical suffering, but yet no one can ever take that salvation away from us. That's it. And most they can do is kill the body, but yet we serve God who preserves our soul and our spirit. And one day will give us the glorious body. Mm -hmm. So what God has promised, let us be fully persuaded that he is able to keep it. No matter what the promise may be, whether it's the eternal life or God's return or just his providing for our needs. There have been countless times throughout history we see of God providing for the needs of his people. And yet, I know many of us when the bank account looks thin or covers are looking empty, we start to doubt, don't we? All right. One of my favorite examples is, I uh, can't think of his name at the moment, right? Robert Mueller. He ran an orphanage in, over in England, and he had, I forget, several hundred children there and no food. But he said in faith, he sat down and thanked God for the food that he was going to provide. And about that time, the baker came over and said, well, I just felt impressed to bake you some bread. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, the milk truck broke down in front of his house. And the milkman said, well, this milk's going to go bad. You can have it. Amen. So God is able to provide, and even when it looks hopeless. Amen. It's not just fairy tale stories we have in the Word of God. And if you look close enough in your life, I'm sure you can see where he has provided for you or when he has done something when it looks impossible. We, we have great grounds for the hope in which we are provided in God's word. Amen. Let us be very strong. Let's be strong in the faith and not doubt in the promises of God. Lord, Lord willing, next week, just to give you kind of a a teaser, if you will. It's going to be mostly about salvation, how this faith that Abraham had, how it 
I was like unto our salvation today. Because his faith was counted for righteousness, and so it is for us today that our faith and count in Christ is counted for righteousness. Amen. Let's go to the close of that thought. Amen.